and um, for today's topic, as uh, Andre said, um, we have open minds towards uh, transparent publication fees. And I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar today. And um, we will talk about the uh, pro processing charges of articles and books, and as well as uh, transformation agreements. Um, if you like, uh, as An Andre said, um, please uh, Twitter with your or tweet uh, with the uh, hashtag here from OpenAir and from OpenAPC as well. And the recording will be published afterwards, including the this presentation. The today's agenda is um, more fine grit uh, and give you an introduction about APCs, BPCs, and transformation agreements. Uh, we will take a, a brief over a brief overview about Open APC, the passive participations. Um, we linked our work to Open Air and the European Open Science Cloud, and have a conclusion and uh, hopefully a wonderful discussion with you afterwards. Um, but who we are? Uh, who we are? We are um, a team from Bielefeld University Library. Um, Christoph Boschinski is today with me. Uh, as well as Julia Bartlewski. Christoph is the lead architect and developer of OpenAPC, of the OpenAPC project, and uh, starts back in uh, the history <laughs> as well. And uh, Julia is the co-lead, and I'm really excited that you are both with me today. Uh, but a team is uh, nothing without a co-founder, Dirk Pieper, could not be uh, today with us is currently also the project uh, project coordinator um, and Jochen Schierwagen as uh, Open Science Advisor. Uh, we have Zabil Schaaf from Open Air Nexus and EOS Future team with us. And uh, my name is Andreas Czerniak and I'm the Open Air Nexus Service Manager of Open APC. Um, first of all, before we start the presentation, um, I will ask you uh, some questions. And um, we have prepared some questions for you. Uh, first of all, um, as you shown in the chat mostly, but uh, we would like I would like to know where you come from. Um, so, which continent uh, are you attending currently um, this meeting, well, this, uh, our session today? And uh, I will share with you here the leads, the question, and I see most of you comes currently from Europe, uh, because we are Europe-based, but we have also from Asia, America, and Africa. That's uh, very good. So I think we can see most have ta selected. Okay, thank you. I will share the results with you. Um, so you, as you see, Europe, of course, but also from Asia and America, that's uh, welcome also to you explicitly and Africa. Thanks for this. And if you like, you could also share your location in the chat. So our next question is um, regarding your uh, department and in which department you are uh, currently active or act with. Comes you from a library or you are a researcher and working in, in science. You are uh, more than in the organization administration. 
um, in a, from the consortium, from a funder, or from other that we don't have here currently. Um, so please share with us your um, departments. So I'm waiting for some seconds. I, and I'm not sure if the pool is, is visible to the participants. Oh, well, excuse, I am. We are receiving some feedback in the chat that is not visible. As far as I can see, it's closed now. I don't know why. Reopen. Can I relaunch? Is it yes? Is it now visible? Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the hint. Okay. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm waiting two more seconds here and we'll end the pool um, now to share results with you. Hopefully you could, uh, you can see the results. So from the libraries, from the science uh, projects and also organization administration and consortia. Thank you. So, and hopefully the last question before we start is, to, um, have you already dealing with article or book processing charges in your position? And now I can see there come some votes in and so many of you has already voted here. And I will give two more seconds before I close this pool and come to our back to our presentation. So, so thank you everyone for voting. Um, as you can see, hopefully, um, most of you uh, comes from uh, our librarians, um, some scientists here, something had nothing to do uh, anything with uh, article processing and book processing charges. Um, and some is from financial accounts as well. Thank you for, um, for your efforts to provide your stuff here. So, and with this, I come back to the presentation and would like to give the digital floor uh, for the introduction part to Julia. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Andreas. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes, I can Great. hear you. Uh, and a warm welcome from me as well. I'm really delighted to uh, see so many people taking part in today's uh, webinar. So the poll just showed that most of you have already been in touch with APCs, BPCs in some form, 
but not everyone has yet. So we'll start with a little background so that we are all on the same page, basically. So next slide, yeah, thank you. So first of all, let's have a look at APCs. What are they and why are they important? So APC stands for Article Processing Charge. It describes a one-time uh, fee which has to be paid to a publisher to have an article published open access in a scientific journal. It can either be mandatory for fully open access journals or optional for like hybrid journals. And the chart of APCs has become very common for open access publications and pay are paid by academic institutions, funders, authors, or libraries, depending on its context. So basically, we are in a transition process in which scientific publishing is shifting to open access. So payments to publishers are transforming from subscription fees to APC-based models and also to transformative agreements, which I will talk about in a minute. So APCs allow transparent reporting and cost monitoring for publications in open access journals. In addition, one can say that many fun funders now only support publications in full open access journals, as stated, for example, here in the Horizon Europe Agreement. So similar to APCs for open access books, we have the so-called BPCs, the book processing charges. And these are also one-time fees that are paid to publishers to publish a book as open access from right from the start. So there's, as we noticed, an increasing focus on supporting open access books as it allows especially authors like from the humanities and social science to publish open access. In this area, area it seems the focus of publications tends to be on monographs rather than journal articles compared to, let's say, the natural science. So the BPC market is developing, which is quite notable but enabling cost transparency and reporting is still at the beginning compared to um, APCs. Next slide, we have uh, transformative agreements and transformative agreements have also a signific significant impact on the open access transformation. Uh, in the existing subscription models of journal, journal access are linked with open access publishing options. So basically, uh, these agreements aim to transfer, transform subscription-based journals to open access and spending for subscriptions into open access publishing. So also known as publish and read agreements, transformative agreements enable reading access to journals and at the same time like, regulate open access uh, publishing in these journals. So basically one can say they transform a large numbers of articles in hybrid journals into open access articles. Um, the average cost per article are hard to calculate for these kinds of um, publications, but Christoph will show you more details later on. Uh, and I think that's, that will do for a little overview. So the next question is why is transparency of these costs useful? On a larger scale, one can argue that transparency of, pub of publication costs contributes to the open access transformation in general, as it enables a comprehensible cost allocation. So monitoring and steering of the open access trans transition requires solid data on payments. Good and transparent data enables cost comparisons between publish publishers, which may counteract publisher-driven price increases. Moreover, one can say it provides an overview of payments from scientific institutions to publishers in general. On a small, smaller scale, in the next slide, uh, making costs on open access publishing transparent has benefits for 
single institutions, consortia, or funders. For institutions, it enables cost comparisons with other institutions. So APC amounts can be negotiable, negotiable um, by institutions and information on what others have paid is very helpful. So you get an overview of how the costs are di distributed across the different publishers and to know what has been paid of, is of course essential for budget administration, as well as when applying for funding. Also for consortia, it, uh, cost transparency is useful as it helps to improve uh, their position against publishers when negotiating conditions. And for funders, transparency is important as well regarding monitoring aspects. So basically which amount was paid for which article to which publisher. So, and in the next step, I want to talk a little bit about Open APC in general. I think some of you might have already heard of our project or are familiar with it. So Open APC is an open data project with, which was established at Bielefeld University Library back in 2014. We collect and disseminate data sets on fees paid for open access publishing under an open database license. What we do so is basically we aggregate cost data on open access publishing. We aggregate APCs, we aggregate since 2016 data on transformative agreements, and since 2020, we also uh, started on aggregating BPCs. So for these, three different types, OpenAPC op operates three different data sets. What are our aims in OpenAPC? Our aims in general are to establish cost transparency and also comparability, because you know if you want to like policy or make decisions within this open access transition framework, you need good data and numbers. An important step to achieve this is by enabling transparent and reproducible reporting for institutions and funders. Christoph will explain the reporting to OpenAPC in more detail in a minute. OpenAPC also wants to help to track development of cost over time. The next slide, please. Here, this chart shows the, the evolution of our APC data set over time with some major events being marked separately. But the important thing you can see here very well that the number of records has increased continuously over the years. The next slide presents some current facts and numbers in more detail. Yeah, you can show them all. We always like to present them at occasions like this, because you know, they always uh, go up. So our APC data set is the largest one. It consists of uh, over 178,000 articles, which are provided by 393 institutions. And if you go ahead and sum up all the APCs in the data set, you get to a total sum of over 345 million euros. The average APC, as you can see in our data set, is 1,930 euros. So there's a lot of money in open access publishing. The BPC data set is uh, somewhat different in terms of numbers. Here we have received data on 1,577 books from 34 institutions with an aggregated sum of over 10 million euros and an average BPC of over 6,000 euros. So uh, for the webinar, I um, looked at the history of our data submissions and exactly one year ago, only 18 institutions had actually submitted data on um, monographs to us. So we can see from this that the topic of open access books is also becoming more and more present in our context. So finally, a short overview of our so-called TA data set, which provides 
information on public publications within transformative agreements. Here we have data on over 66,000 articles submitted by 327 institutions from 40, uh, 54 agreements, different agreements. So that will do for a little overview. I now hand over to Christoph, who will present to you how to contribute to OpenAPC. Yeah, thank you very much, Julia, for the nice introduction. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, the, so to say, the inner workings of OpenAPC, about our data workflows and data routines. But I also want to talk a bit about our uh, data submission process, because um, in the initial polls, we saw that uh, a lot of you are working as librarians and also had um, already been working with uh, APCs. So um, as all of our data is uh, contributed on a voluntarily basis by institutions, as we saw, we are uh, at uh, almost uh, 400 participating institutions at the moment. Um, some of you might be possible candidates for um, submitting data to OpenAPC. And um, I want to talk a bit about the submission process. And um, I think you will see that it is really fairly easy because that's one of our goals to make the, the data submission process as, um, as easy as possible. So um, first I want to um, highlight our data handout. Um, Andreas, I don't know if you can click the link possibly or is it not possible? Let's see. Ah, a wonder of modern data processing. Um, this link leads to our GitHub repository. And uh, this data submission handout, basically, it, it sums everything up you need to know when you are considering uh, contributing data to OpenAPC. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. I think you can uh, read it for yourself later. Uh, so we can go back to the slides, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the handout, you will find um, what is very important, the definition of costs, because OpenAPC aggregates costs on open access publishing. And um, when we say we aggregate costs, the definition of this term is, of course, very important. For example, there are questions like, um, if you pay an APC, um, are taxes, uh, value added taxes, for example, are they included into the, into the cost lump sum? Or are things like, um, uh, like submission fees or things like uh, page charges are they part of an APC? Spoiler, they are not. Um, but this is all important to know because um, if you want to contribute data to us, you have to know what kind of data you have to contribute. So you need a definition of cost and that's all included in the handout. Um, second thing is, how do you send the data to us? Well, the most, um, the most common way is to just send us an email to our project address. Um, I don't know if it's included into the slides. It's uh, openabc at uni-bielefeld.de. Um, sending an email is the uh, most common way. I think over 99% of our um, participants just send us an email basically every year, which contains uh, an, um, a CSV or Excel, uh, Excel sheet with all the, um, with the uh, APC expenditures for the recent year. Um, what you can also do is you can, if you're a bit more technically savvy, you can go to GitHub. And if you have a GitHub account, you can make a pull request there. So uh, you can integrate your files directly into our repository. That's a bit more of an advanced way, but uh, that's not really necessary. Seeing an email is uh, the preferred way and it's, it's totally, totally okay. And if you are a very advanced institution, I'm just mentioning this for the, for the sake of completeness, um, you can do something like um, exposing your data uh, from your institutional repository. Um, some institutions do that. Um, they um, do something like we can see in those in this little uh, graphic below. Um, 
they basically integrate the data from their university financial accounting systems directly into their institutional repositories. So we have a repository with uh, all this bibliographic data like title of the um, of the journal and the publisher and um, the, the article title and an ISSN, for example. And there's also a field for, um, for costs for this article, open access costs. So there's a field for integrating the APC. And then we from Open APC can come to your repository, do uh, harvesting you, via the OIE PMH protocol, and we can directly fetch those articles from you. But uh, that, that's, very ex that's very advanced and only, uh, I think, four or five institutions are doing this. So um, just for the sake of completeness, that's, that's not really necessary. Just send us an email. So next slide, please. Um, who can submit data to us? Well, the easiest answer is everyone. Um, single institutions like universities or research institutes can submit to us. Um, also, uh, larger bodies like national aggregators, uh, library consortia, uh, funders, for example, with all these kind of uh, different institutions submitting data to OpenAPC. And a um, bit of a question is always, um, of course, um, how to collect the data in the first place. This is basically the most difficult question, perhaps, for you as, uh, as a librarian, for example, working at the library. Um, if you've paid for article processing charges, how do you uh, link those uh, financial cost data with the bibliographic data of the articles? So this is often the, the most difficult hurdle to, uh, to overcome, to collect your data. But uh, if you've managed that, then it will be quite easy because, as we can, as we can see in the next slide, Um, reporting the data is uh, really easy. Um, we use a common for format CSV, uh, comma, separate for, comma separate value files, and it consists of 18 data fields, but only five of these are mandatory when you are reporting your data to us. Um, I think we have a small, uh, yeah, small overview here. Um, as you can see, this is our open APC data schema. And uh, it consists of 18 data fields, but only the first five of those, which are marked in orange here, um, those are the data fields you have to include into the table you are sending to us. So it's the name of your institution. It's a period value, which is, basic, which is um, the year the uh, invoice for the APC was paid in. Then it's of course the amount. Um, we are preferring uh, the amount in euro, but you can also send us, uh, us uh, in another currency. Uh, we can automatically convert it. Then we have a DOI. That's very important because um, the DOI is the main identifier we are using to basically bootstrap our enrichment process. We will um, have a look at that in a minute. And we also need an information, information on the hybrid status of the journal the article was published in. So it, if it was a, a gold OR journal or a, a hybrid journal. And uh, all the remaining fields we can see here, um, you do not have to report to us because we are enriching them with our automated enrichment routines. For example, those blue fields we can see here like the publisher or the journal title, we import from uh, Crossref. Then we have, for example, um, the ISSNL, the linking ISSN, which we get from the ISSN organization. Um, we have PubMed ID and PubMed Central ID, which we get from Euro PubMed Central. And we also get data from the UIJ if the journal is included there. So next slide, please. Um, this is a bit of a wild picture. <laughs> um, this shows how the enrichment workflow takes place. Um, I think you don't have to understand it in all detail. Um, what we can see at the top is, um, you can't really see it, it's a bit small, but um, that's basically the, the five um, fields, which are which you are reporting to us when you are sending us data. And what we do is that we take the DOI, that's why the DOI is so important. And we first go to Crossref to uh, query if this article is listed in Crossref. And if that's the case, then we go and uh, we see that it's a journal article. That's also a kind of information we obtain from Crossref. Then we get to the left part of the workflow. And um, we basically obtain all the data automatically. 
As you can see, we go then to your PubMed Central and get the PubMed Central IDs, then we get to UAJ, then we get to ISSN organization, and finally to Web of Science. And then we end up on the lower left, which a uh, fully enriched um, article and all the metadata is in there and you don't really have to care about it. And the rest, uh, the right part of the graphic shows what happens when you submit a BPC to us. In that case, it's a bit, little bit different because for books, there isn't such an established infrastructure to obtain metadata. It's basically only the DOAB, the Directory of Open Access Books. But uh, in the end, it's basically the same. Also for books, the metadata is uh, automatically enriched. So next slide, please. Um, what happens when you um, report your data to us? What are the benefits? Uh, what we do is we uh, do a lot of uh, data analysis and data dissemination. For example, what you can see here, these are uh, plots and tables which are integrated in our uh, data reports and in our blog post, we create a blog post uh, for every data submission, you so you will get some nice graphics for your submitted data there. And next slide, please. Um, what OpenAPC is perhaps uh, most famous for are our tree map graphics. So um, we operate a service where we um, generate um, these nice little rectangle graphics. They are called tree maps. And what you can do here is that you can basically um, click into the data so you can uh, explore the data on different levels and uh, from different perspectives. So that's very nice if for, for gaining certain insights on the data collection, which we uh, already saw is quite large at the moment. Um, you can find these graphics at uh, that URL on the upper right, tremaps.openabc.net. And uh, perhaps Andreas, you can uh, click the link, which we see there. Yeah, thank you. That's the tree map site. And as we can see, we, you can hover over the tree map and um, yeah, thank you. For example, you can click on one of those rectangles and then you get down basically one level. So what Andreas did here, he clicked on one of the, more on one of our participants. I think it's the FWF, that's the uh, Austrian uh, science funder. And what you can see here is all the journals, that's the next level, the, uh, the journal level, um, the FWF uh, paid APCs in or published articles which were paid, um, which were paid for. So um, perhaps you can go back to the, um, to the, uh, to the main uh, URL, click on the open APC link on in the upper, yeah, that one. Thank you. Because what we can see here, that's interesting. Uh, we have this little world map there. And um, that's basically one of the reasons why we are uh, doing this webinar. Um, because as you can see, most of our participants at the moment are coming from Europe. Um, I think we, uh, if you can hover over it again, um, yeah, 382 institutions from Europe from, um, from uh, basically almost 400. So we have really have a great majority of European participants. And we have some from North America, if you can hover over there, I think it's uh, yeah seven from the US and from Canada. But um, as you can see, there are still many, many white spaces on the map. For example, we have at the moment, not one participant from uh, South and Middle America. We have, uh, I think only one participant from Africa. Uh, we have no one from, from uh, South Asia, for example, there's no one from India, no one from China. And um, of course, these are white, uh, white spots we really want to fill because uh, at the moment, it's really a very European project. But of course, uh, APCs and BPCs, they are basically paid everywhere on the world. And uh, we, would, uh, we would be really interested in data from other regions. For example, we really want to know um, what's the what the set of status of open access uh, publishing and payments for it in Africa or in South America. Um, are those the same? Are the prices on the same level? Or, for example, do they get, do they get a discount from the publishers? These are things which are not known at the moment, and um, we only can fill these gaps if uh, some institutions from those regions of the world um, do submit data to us. 
So uh, that's really something we are striving for at the moment. Um, I think we can go back to the slides. Thank you. So that's the tree maps. And um, next slide, please. So um, yeah, that's uh, basically the data schema for the other data set for our BPC data set, which contains data on uh, book processing charges. It's uh, somewhat similar to the, um, to the journal article set, the open APC data set, um, but it's the same principle. Um, you only have to report five data fields to us in your tables. And the other ones are basically enriched by us by querying those metadata services. Um, what we what you have to, um, to submit is again the institution name, a period, and the euro, which is a BPC, not an APC in this case, also a DOI. And then we have this field. This is special for, um, for open access books. It's the backlist OA field. Um, it basically um, tells us if this uh, if this book in question um, was already open access from the beginning when it was published. Or it if became, or if it became open access later because um, someone basically freed it by by paying an BPC uh, retroactively. Um, it's basically in most cases it will be the case that the book is um, open access from the beginning because BPC is um, paid right uh, after publication. But there may be some cases where where there may be some cases where it's not. And then to, for the sake of completeness, on the next slide, we have the um, TA data set Julia already mentioned. Um, I won't show it here because that's not really that relevant because uh, the TA data on transformative agreements, that's data which is usually not reported directly by institutions um, because uh, the cost data for TAs is um, that's quite quite complicated because there's so many uh, so many different um, models on payment and costs in within the field of transformative agreements. So um, TA data is not really reported by single institutions. Uh, we get those, this kind of data usually only by funders and um, and uh, national consortia, for example. So um, I think that was my part on uh, the inner workings of OPBC and how to contribute to it. Um, I think we all saw that it's really not that not that uh, difficult. Basically, all you have to do is um, to compile a table with these uh, five mandatory metadata fields, and um, then basically send it to us, and we will handle all the process. And um, I really want to encourage you if there is some possibility for you to to get your hands on some payment data be it bpcs or apcs in your institution um and we would be really happy if you could provide us which uh, with uh, such a data set and it really doesn't have to be that large um i think we have uh, we have participants which uh, have only i think contributed a data set of only five or six articles and that's perfectly fine because every bit helps the project all right, then uh, I think Andreas will have some uh, more remarks on the European Open Science Cloud and how OpenAPC and its data uh, fit into that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Yes, of course. So, um, and uh, I will uh, take a look, brief lo uh, look to the Open Air services, uh, which are integrating OpenAPC. Uh, the OpenAPC dataset uh, directly from the GitHub um, that uh, Christoph has shown. So the open air research graph uh, harvesting the OpenAPC dataset, which uh, covers B APCs and BPCs, and integrate these in the open air research graph. Um, on the bottom, you can see the open air research graph. Uh, on the uh, right side, um, you see the literature, the publications, the data sets, um, the software and other research products and so on. And in open air, this is called uh, the research, uh, research product. A research product comes from a data source, which you can find on the 
top left middle um, and uh, has authors identified by ORCID, uh, mostly comes from projects, uh, is linked to projects and funders and funding streams and so on. And uh, into this graph, the APC and the BPC uh, links on the one hand to the publication and on the other hand to the organization that are provides uh, the uh, processing charges to the Open APC project. And then for this, um, the Open Air Research Graph integrates and link these uh, amount together. And um, one of the services that I use these APCs currently is the Open Air's uh, service mo called Monitor, uh, which uh, are showing the APCs currently over the time, what is published uh, firstly and uh, the latest one, and as well as give you an overview about the top journals, similar to the tree map that you can, that Christoph has shown before. Um, on the one hand for total APCs, but also for the average ones. These are um, short overview about the APCs in uh, open air currently. The open air monitor based on the open air research graph. And these open air research graph is also one of the core component for the European Open Science Cloud. And here we would like um, to have Open APC as well. So um, it, the European Open Science Cloud is a trustworthy and virtual and federated environment uh, for an interdisciplinary scientific collaboration in a fair manner, of course. So, and here uh, we would like to achieve um, some cost estimation for open access publishing as well as uh, the estimation of cost for um, public uh, publishing of uh, the research results for researchers. Um, it is a short look out, um, a short outlook is the uh, Open Science uh, Observatory, uh, which is an open air EOSC uh, joint service. Um, which will, uh, which is also based on the open air research graph and uh, will also be uh, presents the BPCs and APCs uh, to uh, each country, as you can see here for the publications. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude uh, the presentations on based also on, on the time <laughs> that we have. Um, so open APC is, uh, I, I, I will say fully compliant with fair principles is open, uh, it's community driven and fully transparent. Uh, it is um, as, as it is, on, on GitHub, um, you can uh, search and evaluate the uh, raw and enriched data as uh, Christoph has shown before, all available on GitHub. Uh, you can um, take a look to the visualizations um, and as well, um, if, you find the open in the open APC blog the uh, reports for uh, for your institution or for other institutions and can uh, make compare uh, these data sets. Um, APCs and BPCs, as Julia and Christoph said, comes more and more valuable for everyone. Um, and for especially for the institutions and funders. And uh, as Christoph also said, uh, every data set is very welcome um, to the project to have a 
um, better view on the uh, APCs and BPCs on the global level. For this, I would like to thank you and give you here uh, the contact email as uh, Christoph said, openapc at unibielefeld.de. If you have any questions, we come now in the to our uh, Q&A session. So in the last 10 minutes, um, I don't see the chat currently, but uh, I think I will, op I will open the chat um, as well. And yes. we, we have then, some questions uh, in, in the Q&A section. The questions um, that we have in the chat, I added them in the Q&A area so you can manage all the questions in the q and a area to simplify <laughs> to, uh, to reply to other questions that's great thank you andre uh, let me find here the q and a session on my in the zoom window <laughs> Are you able to see the, the Q&A? Oh, no, I see only the chat currently, but I will stop the sharing and... Um, okay. I will, yes, I could now see the Q&A. Okay, good. Uh, perhaps we can then directly attend to the questions in the chat because um, I think there are many questions which are related to uh, my part especially. Um, if you're okay with that, I can just go ahead and answer them. Yes, so the Q&A uh, could also answer the question um, uh, in, in the uh, as itself. So uh, you can then answer it live or type your answer um, in the Q&A part, um, the Q&A part, um, pl please be aware that uh, we are recording the session. And uh, if you ask your question uh, via microphone or the um, uh, via the Q&A, you can do it also anonymously. So um, how would, could we start? I'm sorry, Andres. Uh, Anna, we have a participant who has raised her hand, so I don't know if you want to let him let her speak first. Anna. Yes, please, Anna. Maybe by mistake. <laughs> So, but uh, Christoph, if you uh, see some uh, the the Q and A, there are um, I'm only seeing you. Um, yeah, I'm only seeing the questions uh, which were posted in the chat, but uh, I do not see anything on the. We are, are, we the same. <laughs> are we supposed to see something on the uh, shared screen by Andre or? <laughs> No, in no, the Q and A, in yes, the Q and A, please. You you need to go to the option below in the in the in the Zoom channel, in which you you have the chat icon and you have on the right the Q and A option to see all the questions. If not, uh, we we can raise the questions and. You so can... yes, uh, I would like to raise question and um, combine this one. Some um, one question from Yu Chang: uh, Print ISSNs are now obsolete regarding OpenAPC. That's one question, and the other question is mandatory data. What if the journal does not use DOI pits? Okay, I didn't get the first one. Can you repeat it, please? Um, the first one was print ISSNs. 
mm -hmm. are now obsolete regarding OpenAPC? Um, you're right that print ISSNs uh, become less important, of course, because um, while well, we are talking about open access, so uh, open access, of course, only um, applies to electronic publishing. Um, we still uh, record print ISSNs in the open APC data set, but that's um, mainly only because uh, they are listed in Crossref. So what we do is we basically um, import all the ISSNs which are listed in Crossref. And um, since Crossref also um, does uh, hold data on print ISSNs, we also integrate that into our data set. But uh, well, basically you are correct. The uh, print ISSNs are not really important. The electronic ISSNs, uh, they are much more relevant to us. Thank you, Christoph. Um, some interesting, uh, <laughs> some interesting questions from Anonymous. Um, we don't have any centralized uh, managed APC fund in our university. APCs are reimbursed to individual researchers from their research grant money based on the APC payment receipts. Are the institutions in a similar positions or similar situations? How do you they monitor their APC expenditures uh, at the unis, in, at the institutional level? Yeah, that's that's a really really good question. Um, I think that's that's really the 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 most or the the really biggest obstacle on the whole process of of, um, of reporting APCs to us, because uh, at the beginning of the process, uh, these uh, these APCs have to be collected somewhere. And um, how this is supposed to happen in, uh, in an institution like a university with different departments and different, uh, different financial, uh, accounting system and whatever, um, that's really, really difficult. And um, to be to be honest, the um, most data which reaches us is um, uh, originates from um, from centralized institutions like uh, like university or a funding um, or OA funds from universities, uh, which are often uh, located at libraries, because um, when they do uh, when they do funding, what they also do is they do the bookkeeping. So they have those uh, those uh, Excel spreadsheets floating around somewhere and can just send them to us. But uh, when it comes to um, a university wide monitoring of APCs, um, that's really a, an unsolved problem. I don't think that anyone has has come up with a good solution to that yet. Thank you, Christoph. Um... Then we have a question regarding the non-euro APCs amount. Mm -hmm. um, when you convert non-euro APCs to euro, what exchange rate do you use for it? Um, that depends on the time frame you can support us with. Um, we, make, we make use of an API by the European Central Bank where we can obtain uh, historical exchange rates. So um, we saw this uh, this field, this mandatory field period in our uh, data schema. This is where you um, put the uh, date of payment in. And um, if this uh, if this date of payment is just a year, then we can we can only use the um, the annual average rate for that year. But you can also uh, put in a more detailed date. For example, you can also include the month or even the day. And uh, if you can uh, pinpoint the specific day of payment, uh, then we can do a very precise conversion because we can uh, use this uh, ECB API to get the, um, the daily exchange rate for that specific day. So then we have a very precise conversion. Um, if you can already provide us with a year, then we have to do uh, with average rate. And then of course it gets, the calculation gets a bit imprecise, but uh, we are flexible in that regards. 
Thank you, Christoph. Um, Um, next question was um, mandatory data was a DUI and as persistent identifier. What is if the journal does not use DUIs or persistent identifier? Yeah, another good question. Um, fortunately, that uh, happens less and less. Um, I think journals which are uh, which are not uh, minting uh, DOIs get really rare these days, but uh, it happens from time to time. And uh, in that case, you would have to support us with uh, with an um, with a substituting data set. Um, instead of a DOI, you would um, tell us the um, uh, the publisher, um, the journal title, the ISSN, and that's important. That's really important. Uh, you would also have to tell us an URL um, where you can basically, which points to the um, to the full text of the article, because um, one important property of the UI is, of course, that you can find or identify the article which this uh, APC was paid for. And if there is no DOI, then we have uh, to rely on some other means to, to detect or identify the article. In, the, in that case, you would have to provide us with an URL, um, preferably to the, um, to the journal landing page or perhaps to an institutional repository um, where this article is stored. So uh, it's, not the, um, it's not the most uh, comfortable process, um, but it is possible. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I think here's a, a comment from Sophie. Uh, in France, the Copperin cons uh, Consortium centralizes information from institutions and declares all data once a year, I think, for Open APC. Is that yes, correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, that is uh, really a very nice workflow because uh, we are in contact with the uh, um, with the Couperon Consortium. Um, and they are also an uh, open APC participant. And they are uh, sending us all this aggregated and uh, cleaned up data in, uh, I think, weekly intervals. So, uh, which um, makes us, which um, is um, very, very, um, yeah, very, very easy for us because um, we get all this data from France, from lots of universities. I think we are about, I think we have 60 or 70 participants from, participants from France. Um, and that's very easy for us because this uh, data is already aggregated beforehand by Cooperon and then sent to us. So we don't have to, to com communicate with each, uh, which, uh, with each French institutions on ourselves. Uh, it's done for us. And uh, that's a really good example of um, how um, how national aggregators uh, can basically play a role of um, of um, making so so to say a link to Open APC, and uh, this is really 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 good for us. And uh, yeah, yeah, good that it, <laughs> that it works in France, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, most countries are not that centralized, and um, yeah, there is no no national or central aggregator in most other countries, which is a shame. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it depends on the time. I, uh, we are uh, six minutes over, but I will uh, give um, Sestar uh, a question from Sestar. It is necessary to sign an understanding agreement before a consortium can be part of OpenAPC. No. No, absolutely not. Um, that's basically one of our one of our um, selling points, so to say. Um, there is no red tape involved. You don't have to uh, to sign anything. You don't have to sign a contract or do some uh, formal registration or whatever. You just send us your data, and by sending th this data, you are implicitly agreeing to um, to putting the data under an open database license because that what uh, that's what we are operating on. And that's basically it. You send us your data, we integrate it, we process it, and then you're part of our PVC. So no, no processes, no red tape involved. So, and um, 
there are some questions regarding the transformation agreements. Uh, it is um, very interesting. Um, one ask for ESAC initiative have abundant transformation agreements data submitted by everyone globally. Any plans to cooperate with them? Uh, we did actually, because uh, I think Julia mentioned the Intact initiative, which was uh, started, which started in 2015, and that actually was um, a joint project by uh, by OpenAPC and ESAC. So yes, we are in contact with them, and we are uh, working together on some of these points. Ah, great. <laughs> so um, let us. Uh, there are so many more questions open. Um, I think we can go through it afterwards and uh, give you some feedback on this. Um, and uh, we should finish uh, this uh, webinar for today. Uh, let me share my screen um, for the last slides. So as a reference, um, you can see here all the links in the, uh, in the reference slide and um, give me the chance to ask you some last questions in a pull. So the question is, can you imagine uh, delivering your article book processing, book processing charges to open APC. Uh, hopefully you see the pull now. Yes, okay. And there are some options um, with uh, yes, APC and BPC and uh, yes, no BPCs, not APCs and so on. So uh, please, um, make a, sing a single choice here for you and I will share this result in a second with you. So, okay, I think it seems to be stabilized. Um, one, two, three. Okay, I'm ending the and share the results with you. Um, currently, uh, some has no intents to uh, deliver Open APC uh, to the Open APC project currently, but um, many of you are since in the, the next six uh, nine months uh, or has a roadmap. Oh, that's great to see. Thank you very much. And um, my last question uh, is regarding to reuse Open APC and reuse the Open Air um, service. I would like to ask you: Could you imagine to use Open Open APC data comes from? the open air research graph or from the open air uh, from the open apc apis directly or from the github um, in your um, process on your website or use as a, a for, for forecast for your institution for a budget um, and i see many of you are already vote for this. Um, so in this case, it's not really uh, explainable, uh, but you can embed some information from the OpenAPC website directly in your web page, uh, but you can also have a um, direct look and uh, analyzing the GitHub um, data set directly. So in this case, thank you very much. I 
ending the pool in three, two, one. And share the results. Hopefully you can see um, is that mostly of you are using, could imagine that use open APC for the budget calculation also uh, for the own analysis uh, from the GitHub or APIs. Um, and wow, some say about to embed the tree maps directly in the institutional website. Great. In this case, thank you very much for providing um, these insights from you. And I would like to thank you uh, Andre and Paula for sharing and hosting these webinar for today. Um, I would like to thank you, Christoph and Julia. And um, I would like to thank you for your participation in this webinar. And if you have any questions or um, feed feedbacks for us, um, and if some workflows doesn't fit your needs, uh, please contact us via openapc at uh, unibeetlefeld.de or um, give us a note via Twitter or so. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And I will give the floor back to Andre.